Hi, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm. I'm gonna ask you to engage your imagination a little bit today and tell me what kind of nursery, what kind of plant business would you like to have if you were to have one? Now, I know not everybody wants to have a plant business, and so just indulge me for a minute and choose from some of the options that I'm gonna give you here from videos that I've presented on this channel. Would you like to have something like Mark's Plants? Mark is a front yard, backyard grower who operates off of a suburban lot, uh, sets up a beautiful little nursery, runs it as a one man show, and just basically does that to augment his retirement income. So that's the smallest scale let's talk about here. Second one, let's talk about my farm here, Fraser Valley Rose Farm. We're a three acre nursery. We currently bring in less than $100,000 a year. Maybe there's a potential to go a little bit higher than that. I can run everything off of two or three people. People, Lisa, myself, and Ron a couple days a week. Uh, maybe we have a chance to go a little bit higher than that. A few small greenhouses, but basically it's a lot of uh, manual work and not a lot of automation. Now going up to the next level here, going up to something that's say medium size, I did a tour of Exemplar about a month ago. That was the grass nursery I talked about. They had those really cool automated uh, transplanting and soil and flat filling lines, a larger staff. Or would you like to have a look at something like a Clearview that I showed previously on this channel here? Large state-of-the-art growing facilities, shipping worldwide, and, and a big retail garden center as well. Do any of these really appeal to you? What size of nursery would you like to have? Now the way that you answered that question, what kind of nursery you built in your head, probably tells you and me a lot about who you are. Are you ambitious? technically minded, business minded, your imagination probably went wild, went straight up to those large, glossy, multi-million dollar retail garden centers or the big growing facilities where they have access to the latest technologies. But if you're a little bit simpler and you're thinking of a small backyard nursery, maybe you enjoy teaching people about plants and interacting with people directly about plants, kind of like I do. Um, maybe something on a smaller scale is more to your tastes. Whichever way you think about it, whatever scale you build this thing up to, the focus of this video actually and the rest of this video is asking what happens after the build. It's because it's easy to imagine the upswing, the building, the buying, the conglomerating, the hiring, but what happens when you hit the end of your useful life in that nursery, which inevitably happens to all of us. And this is something that I've seen uh, real life examples of when they hit the end when they should be wrapping up their business and they don't necessarily have a plan and then it unwinds in a way that doesn't result in an orderly transfer of this business to somebody else. I know this isn't a great sexy topic but there are some good examples in here and I think it applies to more than just the nursery business. The first example I want to use today is of a company called Valleybrook Gardens, and I worked for them for a long time. This is my first employer in the industry. And so I know the story fairly close up, but I'm not really talking about anything here that isn't in the public record anyway. Uh, the company was founded by John and Kelly Schroeder. I've shown you a tour of their place before up in Naramata with the cactus. And uh, they have a wonderful retirement, a good life, and they are a true Canadian success story. Starting their nursery from selling plants out of the back of a truck to local nurseries and to building a national brand of perennials growing off of two sites, one in Western Canada and one in Eastern Canada. I remember a meeting we had early on when I was employed there. And by the way, this was my dream job. So I was stoked to be there. And John came into a meeting with the leaders on the nursery and said, I need to let you know that I am making a plan to get to divest of this nursery, to be out of this business. And really it was a very pragmatic thing for him to say. Now, a bit sobering for me as a guy who was just coming into the industry to have him saying, I'm already talking about getting out of the industry, but it's a good thing he made those plans. The thing is, once you've been that successful, once you're dealing with a 25 acre site here, a 30 acre site there, millions of dollars worth of sales and lots of staff and lots of responsibilities, you've got to take these things very seriously and your pool of people you can sell this business to pass it along to is a limited pool so he had to work hard uh, both he and Kelly strategized hard about how to make this happen and eventually it paid off uh, a few years ago they sold off the Eastern nursery to a company called BTN which has done very well with it and then they sold the Western nursery subsequently to another guy now here's where the story gets a little bit uh, more mixed is that even though on paper John and Kelly did all the right things. They made sure they had somebody who was in the nursery business, somebody who had financial backing or grounding. And, uh, you know, 
worked hard to make this work, had terms that could make this work. Unfortunately, it's not always a sure thing. They passed it on to this new owner. And uh, unfortunately, he just wasn't up to the task of running the nursery. And uh, within a couple of years, it, it failed. And so now the site that I worked on is sitting empty. Uh, and it's actually a, a bit frustrating to me because it's a company I worked for and uh, spent a lot of my time and energy being associated with. So it, it sucks to see it go down that way. But this is kind of the point of this story is that even if you are careful, even if you have a plan, even if you work hard to execute it, there's so many variables. So uh, it's something that you have to spend some time way in advance trying to work out. And even then it's not a sure thing. Let's talk about aging for a minute because, you know, we all do it and it can factor into those decisions and make the decisions more difficult as you go along. And the next person I'm going to feature here is another mentor of mine. This is Robin Denning from Brentwood Bay Nurseries out on Vancouver Island, just minutes away from the world famous Butchart Gardens. And every time that I went over to the island uh, when I was younger and we would stop by Butchart Gardens, we would also stop by Brentwood Bay Nurseries, which was a gorgeous retail location run by Robin and his wife for many, many years. And the problem with that, and I talk, I caught up with uh, with Robin many years later when I was buying roses from him, and he was propagating some things for me, and uh, we had some conversations about what happened to your nursery, and that was my question: What happened, Robin? And the answer is, and this is no surprise, th this all seems very logical from from retrospect now, from where I'm sitting, that. It eventually got to the point as he was running this large multi-acre nursery with lots of facilities on it, lots of greenhouses, that the upkeep on that became too much. It was eventually going to take more money to keep it in business and more investment and more staffing. And you have to make a decision at that point. And, you know, Robin was getting older at the time and, you know, health challenges crop in. And so he had to make some decisions about how much of this do I keep going and how much of this do I wind down? And and so he wound it down. He closed the retail part of the operation. He still grows some things on the side and small scale and sells them on the island uh, privately and sells to me as well. But it's not the same scale as it was before. Now here's what he's left with. And this is a challenge is that he's left with a big nursery site with lots of old buildings, some of them glass that have broken glass in them that he would have to put a lot of money into to get them back up to growing condition. And the question of who would buy that, who now has the capital to buy a big piece of property quite near Victoria, BC, where real estate values are very high and bring this thing back up to retail and growing standards. Uh, I'm not sure there are too many people who can actually do that. And, and I'm not sure what his plans are for selling or any of that. But my point being that at some point or when you build something large, uh, the maintenance and the next steps become quite hard. And with staffing being what it is right now, you can't count on the fact that you can just hire in the talent to keep it going the way you want it to. In his case, he folded. Another example I wanted to talk about is Free Spirit Nursery, which is a smaller scale nursery, kind of a, a home-based nursery, uh, which I loved going to, had all sorts of specialty plants. And the story with that is familiar. They got a, a little bit further down the road and the property values in the area went up and up and up and up. And eventually it just caught up with them to the point where it made more sense to sell the nursery as a development. It's gonna be knocked down and turned into houses uh, rather than keep it going as a nursery. This is not an unfamiliar story. Now there gotta be some success stories out there and there are. I mean, I will talk about the tour I took of heirloom roses as many of my viewers may know, Heirloom used to be run by John and Louise Clements. And eventually when they exited the business, they sold it to Ben and his family, who then took it on and changed it entirely. And now not change for the bad, just change for the change. Each person has a different vision of what they want to do with the business. And while it used to be a place where people could come and visit the roses and be open to the public and sort of a show space, he's closed it off that way and now focuses more on shipping the roses across the US and I think has increased increased the scale of the business by many, many times. Bravo for him actually for bringing uh, continuity into a business that might otherwise have perished or have been developed or gone on to being a different farm uh, outside of roses if he hadn't have stepped in. So that's what I would call a happy ending. And there are happy endings here. Sometimes there are family dynasties that take over a business like Van Bell Nursery or Clearview, which is the one I visited out in, in Abbotsford there. Uh, so there are happy 
endings to this, but it's always a matter of planning. What is your succession plan? If there's family, that's a, that's a decent option. Uh, but if you're trying to sell it, you have to think now about what am I going to do in the meantime that is gonna make it continuable. Well, I have to say I'm pretty happy with how deliberate Lisa and I have been about winding up this business because we're always thinking a little bit, it could end at any moment. Um, something could change in our health that means we have to walk away from this and if we did we haven't done so much here that we couldn't just sell it as a home and be done with it the scale of our business is small to medium as i've mentioned uh, there is some money in it but nothing we can't afford there's some payroll in it but nothing that keeps me up at nights uh, and in the end we get a chance to do small projects on the farm here we can build the chapel like we did last year we can build this pergola structure uh, we can put in new gardens we can keep ourselves busy on the things that are meaningful and challenging for us while still knowing that if we had to wind it up quickly we definitely could now do i have dreams of course i do i would love to have some of those automated potting machines uh, but they're expensive they really are uh, capital intensive and take a lot of maintenance and so for now doing it manually is just going to make more sense for us this is what i'm trying to think about is how to balance our lives so that the investment in uh, doesn't keep me up at nights, doesn't uh, put us, uh, us or our family at risk, and that if in the end we build it to a certain scale, and my hope is, my goal is, that we can build this to the scale over the next 10 years, where we're making good money here, that it's an attractive proposition to somebody, and that they might buy it as a whole, buy it as a working business. But if it's not the case, Basically, we've just made some really pretty gardens around our house and there are a few greenhouses on the side that somebody could disassemble if they wanted to put in a swimming pool. And I'm not all sentimental about that. So I kind of know that the exit on this could be that we sell it as a business. It also could be that this is just a rural property that's quite lovely that somebody could buy in another 10 years down the road. And that's not going to keep me, uh, that's not going to harm my vision of my own or Lisa's legacy in the world. That's not really a factor for us. Well, I hope you found this an interesting discussion about the exit strategy from the nursery business, which is a thing that I think most nursery people should spend a little bit of time talking about, thinking about, discussing amongst themselves as they enter in, what does it look like when I leave the business? How do I do that in a way that makes sense for me and my family and the continuity or not of my business? Thanks for watching.